Let's just start. I'll sing from here. And then I'll come join you. It's going to be hard to I know. <laughs> uh, you could adjust this till it sounds... I think, I think you can do it as long as you can hear well. Is my mic on? Do what? I said I think you can do it. Okay. And you got a son? Yeah. Should oh be. Oh my goodness. Is you, are... Test, test. Here we go. You're on, Dave, um, you talk. All my life, two, three, four, and... And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. You got the acoustic coming through a little bit? I'm a little I'm a little bit of a stronger player, so we'll want to yep. make sure that I'm not too loud. Well, do you want to... Oh, I see you. Is, is that... Uh... Yeah,
test. We'll do that after the special. Good point. Okay, yes. okay, no, no. Good evening, everyone. Let's get started this evening. If you'd stand with us, let's sing Footprints of Jesus. Footprints of Jesus. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see each of you here tonight, and I'm excited to be back, excited for Monday night of Spiritual Reset, and just so thankful uh, for each of you that are here, and I hope you came anticipating again that we're going to be fed. Amen. We're going to be fed, so let's expect it, and then let's take it and enjoy it, and then use it in our lives. Uh, we took Lee down through Smuggler's Notch today into uh, Cold Hollow Cider, and he got in line for that free cider I don't know how many times. <laughs> I, I thought he was going to bring his Gatorade bottle in, and I could have brought a gallon jug in, but they might have been offended at that. They might not have liked that as much, but we had a good time going there, and uh, then we came back through Smuggler's Notch, and uh, we stopped at the top and got out and just walked up to the, some of the rocks where we could get a good picture, and it was snowing. And I thought I was going to have to hold on to his pants so that he wouldn't jump off because he was so excited over the snow that was falling. I said, you do know that this means that most of the Vermonters at church tonight are going to be grumpy because it's snowing. <laughs> Lee's going to be excited. Most are going to be grumpy. Uh, but we had a great day and just so thankful to be back tonight. Uh, let's open our service in a word of prayer. And then we're going to have a special song. And then we'll sing one more song and then get into the preaching. Dave Littlefield, you want to pray for us, please? We praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy, your goodness to us, Lord, for your death and burial and shed blood and resurrection. We're thankful, Lord, for the hope that we have for Thankful for all that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. You can be seated. We sang that first song, Foot, Footprints of Jesus. And as we think of the footprints of Jesus, he's always going to lead us in the right direction, right? Uh, the, the verses that came to my mind are Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And as we think about the path that God leads us in, it's always a good path. Do you believe that? It's always the right path. So the song we're going to sing tonight is called The Goodness of God. And I've referenced this song before. Uh, but it's been a song that God has used in my heart, and I pray that it will be a blessing to you as we sing it together this evening. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing. Of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In the darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing. Of the goodness of God, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, surrender now, I give you It's running after me. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing. Of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. You'd stand again with us. We're going to sing, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. I'm sorry, I don't have everything. <laughs> A little bit of uh, reshuffling. What gift of grace is Jesus hiding? Oh, 
night in the Lord's house. It is good to be with you again tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. I know that the week can kind of get long and you're running back and forth to different places and uh, it's a joy to have you come on this Monday night and uh, I'm excited to be with you. Tonight we're going to talk about something that's really practical and uh, I hope that it'll encourage you. I hope that it'll allow you to find a spiritual reset. We're going to get there in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, I just uh, got to figure out what my story, what, what my great memory that I want to share with you is. I've got a couple more, um, but today I'll make it this one. It's pretty as simple and sweet, but it's very relevant to what we did today. Um, we drove um, all the way out to, what's the place? Smuggler's, Smuggler's Notch, all that area. And we went to the place where you got the delicious uh, apple cider. It was wonderful to watch that and to taste that. And then we went um, and drove past the next place, which is Cabot cheese factory and uh the last time we were here um we went there as well and i was really excited to go back there because of that like carousel of samples you get to just walk around and sample the problem is last time we arrived there um that we had arrived just after one of the tour buses all right and i'm telling you these people all came from texas i believe is what they said if i can remember and they had one thing on their mind when they left Texas, and that was the Cabot cheese samples, all right? Because they got in that line, and they were literally, it was packed in as tight as you can imagine, moving around the thing. And so I like to talk to people. Many of you guys already know that. I've walked up and just had random conversations. So I just started, walked up and started talking to one of the ladies, saying, hey, where are you guys from? And the lady behind her was like, don't you talk to him. And I was like, oh, I'm, I was just asking, asking, no, he's trying to sneak in the line so he can get the cheese. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm really not trying to sneak in the line. I was just, I'm just here from out of town, so I was trying to find out. And she's like, yeah, right, I know what you're doing. You just keep watching the person in front of you. Don't let him in. I was like, whoa, baby. So listen, the people that I've received from Vermont have been so kind, but those tourists, they can get a little pushy, all right? So um, the interesting thing is there was a, a little sense of, uh, of I don't know, I got a little joy today whenever the tour bus was literally pulled up in the front of Cabot Cheese, the cheese store there, 
and it was closed. And there were people all outside, like, wondering what was going on. I was like, that's what you get for being mean to me last year. So uh, they're not even going to let you in this year. So anyway, it was a great day. Uh, got to experience the beauty of this country and the area. And wow, wow, it is remarkable. What a special time. Uh, I just feel like the song we just sang says, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And I mean, are you kidding me? We go up in the top of the mountain and it starts snowing. I'm just like, oh, you're too good to me. Like, this is just glorious. And uh, don't worry, you got a little bit longer before it hits here. Although I heard we might have flurries tonight. So if we are, while you're snuggled up in your bed, you better know I'm outside doing this. It's snowing. <laughs> so uh, taking pictures of my kids, I'll be FaceTiming and stuff like that. So we'll see. Hey, tomorrow, me and your pastors are going to go attempt a new sport called pickleball. Have you guys heard of pickleball? Listen, I said, like, we've done some grand adventures when I come here, but tomorrow is the grandest of them all. I'm going to teach you a great game called pickleball. So we're going to go play for a couple, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half in the morning and enjoy this new sport. Look it up. It's a lot of fun. It is the fastest growing sport in America, and it's kind of like ping pong and tennis put together is a lot of fun. So we're going to have some fun. Pray that nobody gets hurt, all right? Um, it's, it is like ping pong, but it gets really aggressive. So we'll see how that works. It'll be a fun time. Um, where, am I, where do I want to go from here? I am excited, so excited about what the Lord has put on our passage, on my heart for this passage tonight that we're going to be looking at. Um, let me tell you, I, God put something in my heart to be a passionate person. I'm, I'm just passionate. My wife often says, Lee, you're passionate about being passionate. And it's like, no, I'm just, ex- I'm just excited about life and people and, the, and God and his word and these things. And so let me just tell you this, Uh, all the way back 15 years ago, um, whenever I was first becoming a youth pastor, my passion was to figure out how to get my students in the word of God. And uh, I I knew that I, I could not give them all the wisdom that they needed, but I know that we have promises that say that if we can put God's word in their heart, in their soul, that it will not return void. And so I figured at least if I fail in all the other ways, if I don't come up with the best games, if I don't come up with all these other amazing things, at least if I can hide God's word in their heart, then it will, it will do something very special. And uh, so I was passionate about it. We tried to do all kinds, of way, all kinds of things to get them in the word of God. And we've come to this season in life now where I'm like, man, I wish I had the technology and all the things that we have in our world today. Because don't you feel like the word of God is more accessible now than it has ever been? By the way, if you don't, let me tell you, the word of God is more accessible today than it has ever been in the history of mankind. It is more accessible. It is available on every single device. It is available in more languages than it has ever been available to. It is available to more people around the world than it has ever been available. The difficulty is that the devices that allow us to have more availability to the word of God are also the greatest distractions that we have ever uh, also witnessed. And so, um, listen, they're like any tool. A tool can be used for good or a tool can be used for destruction. And uh, if you put a hammer in my hand, you're going to get some broken things. If you put a hammer in a carpenter's hand, you're going to get something wonderful out of it. And so this is a tool, and we must understand that the Bible is more accessible. The Word of God is more accessible now than it ever has been. And knowing that, I want to make sure that I'm not distracted by away from the things of God's Word. And so tonight, what my passion is and what we're going to look into is this fascinating concept of discipleship, discipleship through what I call family worship. We've been talking about spiritual reset this week, and it's interesting, we often send our students off to camp, and I I personally do not feel like there has been a greater opportunity for spiritual reset in my life than going to camp. I'm a I am, pa- I am, go figure, I'm excited about camp. I'm passionate about it because God called me and God, God got me, helped me take care of my understanding of salvation through camp. God called me into full-time service through camp. God did incredible things time and time again and all goes back to camp. God called me into missions in, in camp, gave me a heart for the things of, of missions. Um, God helped me fall in love with his word at camp. It has been a time of spiritual reset over and over again. 
But the problem is you get to a certain age and you're not allowed to go to camp anymore. What in the world? (laughs) And so why is it like that? Why is it that the adults, we cannot have a time of spiritual reset? And what I love about Northside Northside Baptist Church is that we say, you know what? We do want a time of spiritual reset. And while while we have jobs and we can't all pack up and just go to a place with bunk beds that your face is three inches from the ceiling. I did that this week. That was pretty fun. Listen, while we can't do that, we can have an opportunity for spiritual reset around God's word like we're doing now. One of the things I was thinking about in regards to family worship is that this is God's ideal plan for discipleship. The church is passionate about evangelism. The church is passionate about reaching the community around us, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the church is passionate about discipling the believer. All right, That is what we are called to do. But one thing that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is that the church's main role is not to disciple the family, all right? That is not the main function because the, 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 the function of family discipleship is to take place in the home. How many of you guys are involved in school outside of the home? You go to either a, a, a public school or anybody, or you've got kids or grandkids involved in school. Maybe you teach at school or anything like that. All right, good. Many, many, many of you are involved in some capacity. Let me tell you, one thing that kind of irritates me about school, and I'm, I might get some enemies on this, is my kids are learning things that I'm going, this is so hard, and it stinks, and you come home and have to work on it like three more hours at home at the end of a day, and I just don't think you're ever going to use this. I just, it's tough. Like, I remember being a kid thinking to myself, I'm never going to use this. And I will tell you, like, the Lord blessed me and called me into ministry, and much of it I use. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scholar. I'm a student. I've written very large research papers. I'm for education. I think it's very, hey, I got an education shirt on tonight. I'm for education. But I'm, I, I just struggle whenever my, my children have to go to school, learn all day, and then come home and then do hours more of work so that they can learn something that they're never going to use. And, uh, and I think that that's probably the case in some of the things that we're going on. I hope they're not listening on the live stream tonight, all right? So here's what I will tell you, though. There are things in the Word of God that will not ever return void And yet, for some reason, the world around us and the culture has taught even me and my wife to lead our children to put such a higher emphasis on the training of those things and to the to the the passive investment in what God has done through his through his word. Um, And so tonight, I want us to look at the role and the opportunity of family worship. You see, People call Lee Tomlin a worship leader. At my church, we have an incredible ministry. I'm so thankful for it. I wish I could kind of celebrate with you and show you even a video of like the choir special that they sang yesterday. We've got a generational choir. There's about 50 students in and about it, about 60 adults, and it's they're all spread out. It's a massive choir, and they sing every single Sunday, and they honor the Lord in mighty ways, and we're so excited about what God has done there, and everybody refers to me in that ministry as the worship leader, the worship leader, and one thing that I try to defer and deflect is... I am one of many, many, many worship leaders here because part of our philosophy of worship is that the nursery workers are also worship leaders. Do you get that? Because those nursery workers are leading these children. They are loving on these children. Some of the children that come into our church and into our nursery, they've never experienced the love of Jesus in a way that they can get from these worship leaders in the nursery. And so we even have the goal of sending out the children at the end of a service on Sunday saying, we had such a wonderful time worshiping with your children today. Because that is our goal. They're not babysitters, they're worship leaders. Do you get that? And as we continue on and we think of the many different people that would just say, well, he's the worship leader. It's his job. We've created a culture within the church that creates a problem because you know what we do? We bring our students to the church and we say, well, he's the youth pastor. Let him take care of the spiritual life there. And we bring our our wife and we say, well, he's the pastor. Maybe he can fix her. Or we bring our husband to church and say, he's the pastor. Maybe he can fix them. And we bring all of these things when that was never God's plan for ideal discipleship. The ideal plan for discipleship all the way back to the book of Genesis is that disciples are made within the home. And so tonight, I want us to talk, first of all, we're going to do three things tonight. I want to look at the very first charge where discipleship is given to people, where discipleship from 
um, in regards to teaching your family a, a, a method of family worship is given in the Word of God. We're going to look at that. Then after that, we're going to look at the pattern of family worship throughout Scripture. And listen, I'm going to give you probably like 5% of the examples. There are examples all over Scripture about how families were unified and brought together in worship and the teaching and instruction of God. So number, we'll do that second, and then the last thing is I want to talk through some practical tips on how can we begin to include family worship in our homes. It's an astounding thing. I was just uh, reading uh, some, some uh, statistics on this subject, and you can go to a Bible college that we would all agree with, align with, a conservative, biblical-based Bible college, and you can take a sample of 100 students and ask them, how many of you had family worship as a consistent part of your home life when you were growing up? In other words, how many of you, your families came together and you engaged in some method of worship, whether it's opening God's word, praying together, reading God's word, singing together, memorizing scripture together on a consistent basis, all right? The statistics said out of 100 people, two of them, two out of 100, 2% said that whenever they engage in home worship, that they grew up engaged in home worship. That is a staggering statistic. These are the children that have grown up in Christian homes and in churches and have gone off to Bible college, and two out of 100 said that we grew up with a consistent plan of family worship. Maybe us passing off the burden of discipling our children is one of the reasons why our families have drifted away from the Lord. And tonight, I believe as we look into Scripture that you will see examples of how God intends for family worship to be the ideal discipleship method for his people. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 is where we're going to begin today. I want to balance my time carefully and all that I have to share. And I, so I'm going to move quickly early on and then try to balance this out. But when you go to Genesis chapter 18, you come to verse 17 is where we're going to be looking. And uh, if you know the story around here, um, these angels come and they meet and they let Abraham and Sarah know that she is going to have a child and they leave. And there's a lot of interesting, um, really entertaining elements around that story that are, that are quite interesting. But then you get down to verse 17 and here's what it says. The men, I'm sorry, 16 says, and the men rose up thence and looked toward Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And now here's the main part I want to look at. 17 says, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Do you remember? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, so are you. All right, you get that? So here's the idea here. Um, it says here in this passage, he's going to have great, and he will be the father of a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. It goes on in 19 and it says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. For I know him. Another translation says, I have chosen him. I have chosen him so that he will command his children and he will direct his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. It says nothing about that. They will take him to the temple so that someone can train them to know and love God and hopefully it'll work out for him. No, it is the responsibility of Abraham he was chosen by God to lead his children, to lead his household, all that are influenced by his authority, to lead them and to keep the way of the Lord and to do justice and judgment so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. What's fan, 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 really interesting about this is during this time, no one worshipped the one true God. I, there's no evidence that anybody worshipped the one true God. And God in his grace came down and selected Abraham and said, I am going to use you from you will from this point on only worship the one true God. You and your household, your family will only worship me. And Abraham responds with obedience. And he says, okay, we will do this. But God chose him so that he would take his people and he would go in this direction. I'm going to jump over here real quickly. And we go, if you think with me all the way over to chapter 
uh, 22, I believe, you've got Abraham and Isaac, and it says that in this passage that God gave him a commandment, and he immediately worshipped, and he went and he did it. And as they're walking up the mountain to make this sacrifice, you know the story, Abraham and Isaac, they're going up the mountain to make the sacrifice, Isaac asks the question, something along the lines of, well, we have this, we have the fire, we have the wood, but we do not have the sacrifice. What's interesting about that is how did Isaac know the process of sacrifice? How did he know what was expected of a sacrifice? No one worshipped God during this time. How did he know? He knew because Abraham had been investing this into his family. Abraham had taught him. Abraham had practiced making sacrifices to God. And in the going and the doing of worshiping God daily, he trained his family. He trained his children and he trained his household. That's why he was chosen, it says in Genesis chapter 18. So from the very beginning, we see a heavenly charge for family worship. God gives very clear instruction that, listen, this is going to be a pattern and it is going to be passed down from generation to generation. In fact, if you take the book of Genesis and you give an explanation, a summary of the book of Genesis, my favorite one is Genesis is about this, creation, fall, flood, Babel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. That's it, all right? Say, what's the book of Genesis about? Creation, fall, flood, Babel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. All right, that's the book of Genesis. Right smack dab in the middle of it is Abraham, who is the beginning of the patriarchs of God is going to use Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and it's going to go on to take his truths through these families, through the generations, so that all may worship him. That's where his plan really begins through the promise right there at, at, at Abraham. And he even pro- prophesies that when you, by you doing this, I will bring my blessing. And we know that he's talking about, I will give you my blessing, which is Jesus Christ. That's the promise that is going to come as a result of these things. So listen here. It's an incredible thing to see right in the middle of the book of Genesis that there is a heavenly charge for family worship. God chose Abraham. He pulled him out of a wicked and ungodly people. And he said, you are going to teach your children and your household how they can grow up and they can keep my ways. Are we practicing that charge? That's convicting. Listen, listen, church, as I sit here, I ask myself, man, okay, God has clearly given the charge. How am I leading this charge with my family? Why do I spend two hours a night working on ridiculous math homework and three minutes in the morning reading a verse and praying together with them. That's my challenge. That's my own conviction. I'm just sharing my own conviction. And I hope that we can all say, man, if we want to raise our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, this must take a little bit of intentional effort. We can't just pick up our Bible on our own privately if we're doing that and then expect that it's going to carry over and pour into our family's life, pour into our children's life. We've got to be intentional. It's a charge. It is a a commission to go to your children and go to your household and teach these things. Let me just say this real quick. This is is random too, because maybe some of you are sitting here saying, well, my time has come. My children are out of the house. My mom may even be watching right now. And you know what my mom does? My mom FaceTimes with my kids. My mom lives in Oregon. My children live in Jacksonville. And you know what my mom does? She FaceTimes with my kid, and she will not stop talking about Jesus. She gets on that FaceTime, and she just, oh, tell me how you're blessed. I've been praying for you. Oh, this is, she goes on and on and on about the blessings of God in our, in our children's life. Like, oh, you're so blessed. All these things. She speaks the truth of God's word into the children. Parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, you still have an opportunity to speak truth into the lives of those around you. So please don't take this message and say, well, it doesn't really apply to me. There are people that God has put into your life that you have the opportunity to disciple. And if you're sitting here saying, well, I don't have anybody, then my request to you is will you pray and say, Lord, will you reveal to me the people that you have brought into my life to influence? Because if it's not obvious, I want to know who they are. And then will you give me the boldness to seek after them and to to speak truth into their lives? Number one, a heavenly charge for family worship. Now I want us to look at number two, a biblical pattern of family worship. 
Honestly, the list went on and on and on as I began to do research, finding people that are involved in family worship. The list is is far too long. So what I did is I said, who are the ones that gave the clearest passage of instruction? Of, Of the people that were engaged in family worship throughout the Bible, who are the ones that were involved in the clearest application, the clearest verse that gives instruction? And so we would we could look through Abraham, we could look through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of these examples. But I want us to first tonight look at Moses. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This should be a passage that we are all very familiar with. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 7 is what we're going to read. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day, with all thy, um, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Listen to this. This is a command. This is a charge for family worship, church. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Wow, in everything you do, you should be talking about the Lord. In everything you do, you should be bringing God's word into it and saying, Holy Spirit, give me, give me ideas and thoughts today of how I can take your word and pour it into the lives of my children, how I can take your word and pour it into the lives of my household. Listen, by the way, if you say, well, those things just don't come to mind. Here's how they come to mind. When you're filling your heart with God's word on your own time, then when you go to speak, they will come out. That's the best way to preach. Listen, you say, well, what does it take to preach? Fill your heart with God's word. And at some point, you can't even help the overflow of what God has shared with you. All right, that is what is happening right now. That's all you got to do is spend time in God's word and then say, God, help me to share these things. And he will provide opportunities that are completely appropriate, completely practical for you to share God's word. So we see here Moses was passionate about family worship. He was given this charge. Moses is telling the children of Israel, he is telling them very clearly, here's what you need to do. I'm commanding you this day that thou shalt teach your children diligently, teach them to And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk in the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. It even goes on to say, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. How many of you have scripture somewhere up on the walls in your house? You got a picture up with a verse or something. Put it up there. Put it up there. My grandparents, uh, they passed away about three years ago, 10 months from each other. And uh, they, they have blessed my life richly. I, that was very close to them. So thankful for their investment. I am up here today because of the investment that they put into my life and because of the unconditional love and grace that they showed in my life, my, because of my grandparents. And listen, they passed away, and we had the, the bittersweet moment of going through their house and going through all these things. And my entire life, you walk in their front door, on the front door, and on the outside of the front door of their house, they had this little fake brass plaque that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I got to take that down and bring it. I've I've not put it up in my house, but it's in a special place in my bedroom where I get to see it there. It's even got the paint over the sides of it from where they just painted the house and got paint on it. And it's special to me. You know what? They made sure that that was not, they they put those words up in the house. They, They looked, listen, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. At the main gate of my grandparents' house, they had the word of God posted up saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And guess what? They lived it out. So put the words up on the walls, church, and then live it out before your children. Make sure that in everything you are doing, you are teaching your family to worship with family worship. Number two, Joshua. Turn with me to Joshua 24, 15. We're going to go through these quickly. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Here's what it says. And it seems evil unto you to serve the, and if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in those lands ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the verse that they had up on the wall. And what an incredible thing that they're taking the words of Joshua thousands of years before that he had that same commitment saying, as for me and my house, church, where are, 
the families that will rise up and say, as for me and my house, let me just jump over here real quickly and say this. Where are the, where are the fathers that will say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? I think I have this statistic I want to share with you real quickly. This is another staggering statistic. It's one worth taking a second to find and share with you. I'm going to go by memory if I don't see it in a second. Uh, here it is. Listen to this. A study focused on Sunday school and found similar results of the impact of fathers in the lives of their children within the church. When both parents attend Bible study, in addition to the Sunday service, 72% of their children will attend Sunday school when they grow up. All right, that's interesting. When mom and dad go to Sunday school, then, then 72% will attend. Listen to this. In regards to church, when only the father attends church, 55% of the children will attend when grown. All right, that's interesting. So it drops significantly when only the father attends church. Then it goes on, it says, when only the mother attends church, 15% of the children will, will continue to attend church when they're grown up. Wow. You say, well, I don't like that. I don't, it's, it's statistics. It's like real data that you can, you can pull it up and see that they went through this stuff and information. When the father is the spiritual leader of the home, that the children will follow more faithfully to the things of God. Now listen, let me just tell you this real quickly, and I, I want to be real transparent but also careful. Sometimes I wish the live stream wasn't there so I could just be super transparent. But here's what I'm going to say. Um, my mom was the spiritual leader in our home. And I am so grateful for my mom's faithfulness. My, uh, in my life, we were raised with family worship. And our family worship was every single morning, every single morning, five days a week, we would get up, we would eat a bowl of cereal, and we had our Bibles open, and we would go through. And our family worship was simple. It wasn't extravagant. You know what we would do? We would read the proverb of whatever that day was. And it would be like there's four people sitting at the table, and I, the first person would read verse 1, the second person would read verse 2, the third person would read verse 3, fourth person would read verse 4, then 5, 6, 7, 8. And when you're like finishing up your right... Okay, and you read your verse, all right, and then it goes around. I know the Proverbs probably better than any, any other book. I feel like there have been times in my life and in my ministry where somebody says something, and boom, the Proverbs just come right out, and it's because my mom was so intentional to invest. So listen, mom, I get the statistics say that the man, the man is supposed to leave spiritually home, in the home, and yes, he is, but when he is not, you take up the mantle and you run with it, okay? Because that's what my mom did, and that's why I'm here today, is because she was passionate about keeping us in the word when I was growing up. It's important. It makes a difference. My life is blessed today. My children are blessed today because of the family worship that took place in our home. After we would finish going around the table every single morning, Monday through Friday, going around the proverb of the day, then they would say, my mom would say, hey, what's your favorite proverb? Which one today stood out to you? And we would talk, everybody had to give one. We'd say, you know what, today the, the one about the slugger turning over back and forth and back and forth like a door on its hinges, that one really stuck out to me because it reminds me of my sister. Like, we just whatever it was, we would take the word of God and we would have fun understanding the word of God together. And then you know what we would do? We would pray. And we had this fun little Tomlin tradition that I, I don't even remember who would start, but somebody would start, and nobody says amen until the very last person. And so, like, I would start, then my sister, and I'd say, and da 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 da, in Jesus' name. But we didn't say amen because we weren't going to hang up the phone yet. You get it? And so then my sister would pray, and she'd pray her prayer, and it'd say, in Jesus' name. Then it'd go to my mom or my dad, and they'd say, in Jesus' name, amen. And we knew now we can get our day started. Family worship changed my life. And I'll tell you this, we weren't amazing at it. We were not, we were not amazing at it. We didn't like say, well, children, today we're going to do a study through the, the, the Gospels. And no, we, we stuck to Proverbs. And so we probably could have improved in some of those things. But guess what? The truth of God's word has not returned void. And it's the effort of taking God's word, tying it about our fingers, putting it up on the walls, repeating it and living it out daily in our homes for our children and for our household that made a difference. So church, I want to ask you, are you following a biblical pattern of worship in your life? Look at me real quickly with the story of Job. Turn to Job. I want to share with you Job chapter 1 verse 5. You say, well, my kids are just too gone, man. They're out partying in the streets. They're out doing their own thing. They're just, I, I can pray for them, but I just don't know what else to do. Well, guess what? You're in good company. Let's look at this righteous man in Job chapter 1 verse 5. Here's what this righteous man did. <clears throat> 
And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts so that Job did this continually. Another translation gives the idea of they would go out and party all night, and just in case they cross the line, he gathers them together the next day and says, you guys come with me. I'm going to go offer a prayer of worship on your behalf. I don't even really understand how all that works, but I know that that man loved his God, and he loved his children, and he wanted to do anything he could to be the mediator between the two. So if that meant that he was on his knees praying and worshiping, if that meant that he's making offering sacrifices on their behalf, he was doing anything he could to build those bridges so that he could save his children. As we continue to read, I want you to see Psalm 78. Turn with me over to Psalm 78. We're going to look at this singer in the Psalms known as Asaph. This is a pretty powerful psalm here. I'd like to read the first eight verses. So bear with me. We're going to read it quickly. And I'm going to try to wrap this up in the time that we want to. So stay with me quickly. Here we go. Psalm 78 verse 1 says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard known unto us, and our fathers have told us. Do you get that? I'm about to tell you guys some incredible things. Bring your ears. Be, listen, come in. Tune in to what I'm about to say. This is what our fathers told us. And then he says, and we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Do you get that? Church, we have mi- we, I have missed it. I have taken, I've hidden these things from the Lord in, in failing to share the praises of what God has done from generation to generation to my children. We cannot miss this. We've got to figure out how we can make up time and share these blessings with our children. One thing I was reading about family worship says maybe the first step you need to do with your family is maybe you need to repent. Maybe you actually need to go to them and say, y'all, we've missed this. We've missed this opportunity. And in the days that we have left, I'm going to use these days to pour God's word into your life and to pour his love and his truth in every way I can. So it says, we will not hide them from our children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Verse five says, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make him known to their children. He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. It's a heavenly charge that we are given to pour God's word into our homes, into our children, into our household. It says here in verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. This is children's children's children. We are passing these truths on. That's how you can see from the very beginning it worked pretty well. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the way down. So we continue reading and it says in verse 7 that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That they might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Then it goes on for like a ton more verses. You've probably got it there. I don't have it on my screen right now, but like 50 more verses telling all of the wonderful works that God has done. How many verses is it? Somebody got it there? What? 72 verses of giving praises to all the things. It's kind of like a brief summary of the history of the children of Israel, going thing by item by item by item, saying, man, you know what? Your great, 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 great father, they told us what God did in their life, and it was amazing. And then your great, 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 great grandfather told us this, and it was incredible what God did in his life. Then you're, you see what I'm saying? I could keep going on, but I don't have time. But it just passes down the great things that God has done from generation to generation. Pass those things down. Be intentional about God's goodness. If you say, well, I don't know my story. Well, then start in the word of God. (laughs) Amen? Go to the word of God and start passing down his wonderful works there. And then start in what you do know. And share what God has done. Share how you have lived in the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Share that with them. 
We go on to the next passage, Psalm 78. By the way, spend some time there. Take that one on your own. Do some personal devotions in there. It's incredible. The first eight verses are all about the generational passing on of God's truth. And then the rest of it is saying, here's what you pass on. Here's what you tell them. Spend some time in Psalm 78. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. What I love about this is you can remember Deuteronomy 6.4 and Ephesians 6.4. Both of them are passionate about generations, all right? Ephesians 6.4, it's a verse you know well. It says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That's often what I feel like we focus on with this verse, the provoking to wrath. It says, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Church, have you, are you bringing your children, your family, your grandchildren up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, well, I, I, I don't know. How can I do it? How can I do that? I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's talk about it. It's a pretty simple, practical thing. We've talked about a heavenly charge for family worship. We've talked about a biblical pattern for family worship. By the way, go study the word of God because you can look on and on in both the Old and New Testament where you see time and time again. Just in my devotions this past week, you get to Acts um, 18 maybe somewhere where Paul and Silas are singing, worshiping at midnight in the prison cell. You know what I'm saying? They're in the prison cell. The earthquake happens. They go home. Guess what happens? The prison guard and his whole family get saved. Like, do you understand that? It's a family ordeal. Time and time again, you say, you see the families come together in their worship and discipleship. We must be intentional. Here's what I would encourage you to do. This is a, recommend, a recommended practice for family worship. It's pretty simple, all right? What should we do to accomplish family worship with, in our homes? Number one, read scripture together. Read scripture together. Listen, it, don't start with nothing. Don't, I mean, I'm sorry, don't, don't start with nothing, but I'm saying don't start with everything either. Don't sit down and be like, children all gather around today. We're going to read Psalm 119, all right? Like, uh, that's a really long one, okay? Like, don't, don't do that, all right? Don't, we're gonna start in Leviticus, okay? That's gonna be really exciting. No, no, be wise about it. Maybe start in the Gospels. Maybe do something fun. Make it fun, y'all. Listen, jump into the Word of God. Maybe go take a, a great series like the Chosen series. Read the passage that it's going to be talking about in the video and then watch the video together. Make it fun and exciting and spend time in God's Word with your children. So number one, read Scripture together. Whether it's a proverb a day, you listening? Whether it's a proverb a day, whether it's a verse you can do more than a verse, but if that's all you've got time for, start there, okay? Start with that, but then continue to say, Lord, give me a passion and a desire to pour more into the lives of my children. So pray, read scripture together. Number two, pray together. You guys see these things up on the screen. Pray together. Pray with your children. You know what? I was a youth pastor, and it was discouraging when we had children grow up in the house of the Lord, grow up in church, and they get to 14, 15 years old, and they don't have a clue how to pray. It's awkward. They're like, I don't know what to do. Um, uh, it's because you haven't been practicing it. You can't go out on a football team if you don't practice. You can't go play pickleball if you don't practice. Well, you can. We'll try tomorrow. But it's going to be funny, all right? You can't do things until you've spent time doing it. The greatest way to get comfortable doing something is to do something that's uncomfortable. You've got you've to break through the barriers. So you've got to spend time praying together. Teach your children to pray on their own. Teach your children to pray. Pray over them. Man, we're going to talk. I'm going to close this out with Jonathan Edwards. And he prayed over his family every single night before dinner. He would gather them around and he would pray over each one of them. This like long prayer. They're probably going, I'm starving. And he would pray over a, a prayer over each one of them every single night before they would have dinner. Incredible things. Pray with and for and over your family. My mom is my greatest prayer warrior. I'm confident of it. Every single Sunday morning, I'm blessed to be able to get up and lead worship but about the time I wake up out of bed, I have a text on my phone. In fact, I have one from yesterday morning that she sends me a text and she says, I'm so thankful for how God is using you. Stay faithful to him. Don't screw it up. Stay humble. I love you. Keep serving Jesus. Like she sends me these every single Sunday morning. What you got to remember though is where did I say she lives? Anybody remember? Oregon. Oregon. All right. I get the text at 7 a.m. Do the math. She's getting up at like 3.30 in the morning to send me a text so that as I'm going into church, that I'm walking into church and she's getting up at three o'clock in the morning to send me a text to tell me that she loves me and she's praying for me and she wants to see God do great things in my life. I'm 38 years old and that means more than I, more than I can even begin to communicate to you. 
I'm so grateful for every text, every effort of pouring into my life that she has made. Pray over your children and then tell them you're praying for them. Sing together. You say, sing together? What's the big deal about that? It's biblical, all right? God commands it, all right? There's plenty of passages in scripture where God says, you must sing. So teach your children to sing. Man, I, church, let me tell you, if, if you, uh, I got a pet peeve, and it's when people come to me and say, well, I can't sing. Well, then why would God tell you to do it? Because God told you to do it. It doesn't, I don't care if you hit notes. Like, I think, here's what I really think. I think that God is up there, and he hears all of the tones together, and there is some incredible chord of harmony that even when we hear it with our imperfect ears, it sounds kind of crazy, but when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, oh, all of those dissonant problems and flat pitches and people that could not sing, with, could not put a drop of a tune in a bucket, it sounds beautiful. That's why he wanted all of his people to sing. That's why he commanded all of his people to sing. It's not a sing if you like it. It's not a sing if it's your thing. It is a sing. Uh, that's the command. It is for all of us to sing and to praise and to rejoice. There is something indescribable that takes place when the heart and soul pours out to the Lord. And then sings, my soul, my Savior God, to thee how great thou art. I can't, I can't say it in a way that I can sing it. And so you need to sing and you need to teach your children to sing as well. Memorize scripture together. That's the one that we all, wait. here's the thing. Here's my challenge for this. And this is the one that punched me in the face. So let me give it to you real quick. People told me, uh, I always say, listen, my memory just doesn't work like it used to. It doesn't work like it used to. And I read a book that said, what if somebody gave you $1,000 for every verse you memorized? I think I can get my memory to work. All right. I think I can get my memory to work. Let's, let's try this out. I, if you're going to give me $1,000, I'll start with Jesus' web, John eleven thirty five. But, um, but, like, but, all right, but then I'm going to keep working. I'm not going to stop there. And I bet you my memory is going to start working a lot better because I'm going to put it in action. And I'm going to try. And I'm going to put the effort in. And that's what I encourage you to do, church. Listen, the Holy Spirit takes those verses that you put, hide them deep in your heart, and he uses them in incredible ways. You say, I don't feel the Holy Spirit working in my life. My thing is, man, have you given him the arrows of God's word? Because as you memorize them and put them in, he will pull them out and use them in your life, all right? Listen, last thing, share testimonies and stories of God's faithfulness. Just find ways to give God the glory for all the great things that he does in your life. Your kids need to understand and see that this is a common thing that God is always working in my life. How should we practice it? My last three tips are this. Last three tips and we're done. Number one, keep it short, all right? I remember the first time I tried to do family worship, like my wife, and we got my son. He's like two years old. I'm sitting there like, we're going to do family worship. It was like, my wife is like rolling her eyes at me. Like, oh, brother, are you trying to teach me something? Because clearly you're not pouring into our son right now. Listen, yeah, that was, that was a little overachieving, but guess what? It would have been good to throw some songs on and sing songs with him about Jesus and do things like that, just to be intentional. Because what happens is this, and I know this by experience, you say, oh, well, we'll get to it at some point, and then the years go by. And it, it just go by, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, my kid's a teenager, and I've not poured the word of God into him like I want. Don't let the time fade away. Keep it short, keep it relevant, keep it applicable to their lives. Be consistent, all right? Maybe your consistency is we're gonna try this every Friday night. We're just gonna do it once a week. Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you need to say we're gonna try it every morning and we're gonna work from there. Figure out what works for your family, but be intentional about pouring into your children. And then number three, be flexible. Find ways to keep it fun. Find ways to keep it fun. Like may, God's word is fun, man. I, it, a pet peeve that I have is when people take the word of God and they make it boring. It really gets on my nerves because the word of God is not boring at all. Half the time I do my devotions, my jaw is dropped and I'm going, oh my goodness, I can't even believe that's in there. If I, I could go through a list of 10 things right now that I'd tell you and I bet you a bunch of you people would be like, no, that's not in the Bible. And I'd be like, yes, it is. Yes, no. A bald man sicked a bunch of bears on the kids that made fun of him for being bald and the bears tore them into shreds. Yes, that happened. Make fun of me for being bald, all right? That's the saying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Listen, the word of God is sharp and powerful as a two-edged sword. It pierces all the way down and it changes our lives. And we need to take it, apply it to our lives, and pour it into the lives of our household. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this time tonight. I thank you for your word. What a gift. What a sweet and powerful gift it is. I pray you'll help us to be passionate and serious and intentional about pouring your word into the hearts and lives of our children. 
in the hearts and lives of our homes, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, maybe even our neighborhood kids. Help us to be intentional about pouring your truths into those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we close, uh, I would just ask us to think about the message, right? That's what we should do at the end of a message, is to contemplate where we have fallen short and then contemplate the grace of God that is calling us to do better through his strength. Um, Lee didn't preach tonight so we all go home feeling bad, right? That's not the purpose. He's not preaching so that we feel guilty over the ways that we've messed up. He's preaching to what? To show us the truth of God's word and to push us into it. So we think about the last 18 months. Think about this question. As we think about the last 18 months, have we spent more time talking to our kids, our family, our friends about the negatives in the world or the goodness of God in spite of the negatives? Think about the conversations you have had recently. When you see somebody the first time, is it, did you hear about this? Did you see this? Have you watched this? Did you hear about so-and-so who didn't do this or did do this? Or are we saying, hey, in spite of all that's going on, in spite of the disease, in spite of sickness, in spite of trial and heartache, God is so good. And yes, some people have lost their lives, and we are grieving, and we're sad over those things. But haven't we been around long enough to realize that even in difficulty, even in death, God is still good? And so what am I going to choose to talk to my kids about? Unfortunately, I probably made that mistake too many times where I've talked about the wrong thing. When I had the opportunity to say, hey, in spite of all that's going on right now, look how God, good God has been to us. And so let's think on that, let's dwell on that, and then let's put that into practice as we take the opportunities that God gives us to minister to those around us, and even most specifically our families. Dave, would you come and lead us in a song? And as we sing, I just pray that we would respond as God has worked in our hearts. Let's stand together. Let's stand together as we sing. All I have is Christ. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. All I have. I ran my hellbound race, different to the cost. You looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. I beheld God's lost flame, you suffered in my place. You bore the wrath deserved for me. Now all I know is. Oh, 
you don't know what to talk to somebody about, there you go. All I have is Christ. You don't know what to talk to your kids about when you're riding down the road. Talk to them about how much Jesus loves them. How much, <laughs> how much God loves them to send his son to die on the cross for their sins. You don't, you don't have to be a theologian, right, Lee? You don't have to know it all. You just have to point them in the right direction and let God keep moving forward. My mom used to always sing a song, Oh, Lee, do you love Jesus? And she knew I'd be like, Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, I'm sure I love Jesus. Tell me why you love Jesus. This is why I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. That's the reason. Y'all ever heard that song? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how. And it was just, that was it. It wasn't a theologian. It wasn't deep. It was just beautiful. Yeah, just beautiful. So take the time, invest the time. And I think when we all grow up, has anybody grown up yet? When we all grow up, we'll be able to stop and look back and say, hey, God used those moments, right? He used those moments where we were faithful to him uh, to point our children in the right direction. It doesn't mean that our kids are going to be perfect. I see some of your kids out there. I know they're not perfect. It doesn't mean our kids are going to be perfect. But what is the hope? The hope is that in God's time and in God's way, they'll come around in the, in the plan and the path that God has for them. And I know some of you here tonight are, are burdened over your children. Guess what? God is burdened over your children as well. And so take the opportunities that God gives to be faithful to him and see what he does in his time and in his way. Thank you so much for that message. Uh, I pray that you'll join us back tomorrow night and uh, night number, what is it? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday night for our third night of revival. And I just pray that it'll be a blessing to you. When you see the snow, don't get mad. Don't curse Curse God. Job didn't do that, but just rejoice because Lee's excited about the snow. Let's dismiss in order of prayer, and we'll let you get on your way. Matt, in the back, you want to dismiss in prayer, please?